Hi, everybody. We're with Michael DeMello today as part of the Intel 2013 Parallel Roadshow. It's a four-city tour looking at some of the tools and techniques for becoming a better Parallel developer. Michael, welcome. Thank you. So you make an interesting point about the role of some of the tools that we're talking about, that they not only make you a better programmer, but actually have the potential to make you better in your subject matter area. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, certainly. It, uh, you know, a, a subject matter expert who uses our tools you know, can, can actually benefit in a couple of ways. You could certainly use the tool in its base form and you know, assess uh, an implementation of an idea, i.e. a computer program, things like this, uh, at a very detailed level and learn a lot about the implementation. But um, one of the things that comes out of that is a very natural uh, thing. It's, uh, you know, you've implemented something, you've done a task, and you can ask the question, well, have I done the task well? Can I do it better? Is it actually in optimal form? In other words, can I do it no better hmm. than what I've done? Hmm. Now, and the tool can actually help you with that assessment. Hmm. One of the ways it does it, for example, a simple example of that would be um, with our event-based sampling. You know, it gives you an idea of how many instructions, in other words, uh, you are uh, retiring uh, per cycle, for example. And of course, there's a theoretical limit to, to, to what you can do with that on any given piece of hardware. The tool helps you assess that for a given piece of code, and so you have an idea of, quote unquote, optimality. Hmm. So it's, not, it's, uh, it's something along the lines of saying, you know, I've done this task uh, versus I've done this task well, hmm versus I've done this task in its optimal form hmm. or in an optimal way. So you become better at your craft and gain greater insights into what it is you're trying to do by doing this in the first place. Yeah, it could, it could have that effect. Uh, uh, could you give me an example of how that might look? We're here, for example, today at Schlumberger, uh, an Intel customer and, and certainly a, a powerful user of these kinds of tools. How, how would that dynamic work, say, if I'm a, a seismologist here? Mm -hmm. So a seismologist is a very good example. This is a, a, a practitioner who uses, who does rather complicated things. You know, they are uh, often handling very large amounts of data. And of course, uh, at a company like Schlumberger, you have a number of uh, people, a large number possibly, who are extremely practiced at their craft. Mm -hmm. They've done this for decades. Schlumberger has done this as a company for decades. They're leaders in their field, basically. Mm -hmm. And these folks, uh, uh, you know, leverage Intel technology, hardware, software, etc., to to guide them uh, into doing even better and better implementations of their uh, computer programs. Mm -hmm. uh, so, at Slumberger, for example, you know, they uh, they could look at something uh, that they might have done a certain way for many years. Now, with the changing hardware, with all this, uh, as as Gary Carlton in the previous interview. Uh, put it, the explosion of, uh, uh, of parallelism, of cores on, on a box, uh, of the, the size of vector units and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. You know, those things, to leverage all that takes a little bit of a, of an, of a different kind of skill. And this is where the tools could help a, a practitioner, an experienced practitioner mm -hmm. of his craft do it, uh, you know, even better. Hmm. Now, in the Go Parallel world, we've got a whole range of people from students just starting off and learning the discipline to very advanced practitioners. Just to make sure that we're all on the same page here, mm -hmm. I always like to do a level set. So, if you could talk, uh, say, a minute about each of the tools that you're talking about here today, um, what they are and what problem they solve or what function they serve in the process. We'll start with VTune Amplifier XE 2013. Okay. So VTune Amplifier XE uh, 2013 being the latest uh, latest version of it uh, has been around a long time. It's been around for more than a decade, easily more than a decade in the marketplace. And at a base level, it is a profiler. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a profiler, just like a traditional profiler, which will tell you uh, where time is consumed in a given computer program. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, out of that comes the, the concept of a hotspot. In other words, out of this uh, program, which is, let's say, composed of a number of tasks, which task or which area of the code is taking the most time. And so at base level, that's, you know, that's very base level functionality that VTune provides, uh, just like a number of other profilers. 
uh, on how you might actually uh, attempt to optimize a piece of code. Take a large piece of code, use the hotspot analysis to narrow your focus to a smaller piece of code, and then you do a more in-depth uh, uh, analysis to guide you on how you might improve that uh, that section of the code, which is the rate determining step. And what is new in the, the 2013 version? So a number of things. We've uh, uh, enhanced uh, uh, the call stack functionality, for example. Um, one of the great things about VTune, in addition to all the time-based profiling like hotspots, locks and weights, concurrency, uh, and a number of things that you could do uh, and the time-based uh, approach, we have a number of uh, a, a very, very good functionality on the event-based side. In other words, uh, profiling that relies not on an OS timer, for example, but uh, on the hardware itself. Mm -hmm. So it looks at how your program is driving the hardware, and it um, collects metrics on that interaction, if you like, and it represents them in, in, in an easily understandable form. Mm -hmm. So one of the new things that has come in with 2013 is the ability to actually capture call stacks, you know, something traditionally higher than the hardware, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in an event-based analysis. Mm, neat. Very nice. Uh, Inspector XE 2013, same questions. What uh, role does that play in the process and what's new? Okay, so a number of, so Inspector XE, first off, is a, is a, a correctness tool. It's a runtime correctness tool. And specifically, it looks for memory errors uh, or potential mem memory errors and potential uh, uh, and threading errors and potential threading errors. So, what's good about uh, Inspector? It's a very important part of the uh, uh, developer toolkit. You know, you've written a piece of code. You really want to know if there's any potential for it to operate in a manner that you didn't uh, expect it mm -hmm. to. In other words, potential for any erroneous type of operation, right? So. That functionality has been around a long time, been around itself for more than a decade in the marketplace. Uh, and on top of that, with 2013, what we've built is we've built uh, the ability, one of the things we've built into it, is the ability of the tool to interact directly with a standard symbolic debugger. In other words, you could set it up, and set it up here means pointing and clicking with the GUI, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, checking out a couple of items, you know, checking off a couple of items, selecting them, in other words, starting an analysis and setting it up so that when it hit a, a, a problem, it would uh, break into the debugger, into the symbolic debugger. The reason for that is that you might want to know, in addition to the fact that an error has occurred, you might want to know what the other variables around that error looked like mm. at the time of the error. Mm. And so uh, it's, a, it's a very, very powerful, very nice uh, new feature that uh, I think is going to get a lot of uh, traction among developers. One of the things I hear when you talk about the new features is an emphasis on getting up and running pretty quickly. I mean, I hear a lot about GUIs, and it sounds like it, it's probably easier now than it was a decade ago to get started with these tools. And w what is the ramp time? I mean, we're talking about in half an hour, can I be Absolutely. relatively... It's short. I won't say fluent, but up and running and, and doing stuff. Absolutely. So, you know, um, with with any of these tools, so the, the the range of things you can do with them is considerable. So it's just like learning a musical instrument, right? You take your first class, you learn a few things. Take another class, you learn a little bit more, and over time you get more and more proficient at it. It's the same kind of thing with these tools. Hmm. You know, to get started at this point, uh, given the uh, kinds of uh, getting started tutorials that are available. The instructional videos that are so easily available on the web off of YouTube, in fact, hmm. uh, or off software.intel.com, uh, a novice could essentially uh, implement, I mean, install the tool, go through this uh, getting started tutorial, which takes about 20 to 30 minutes hmm. for, for, say, VTune and for Inspector, uh, and can be ready to go with some off and, uh, yeah, running. Off and running, doing the basic analyses. Uh, over time, as I said, you know, there's a pedagogical element to this. The user learns more about what he's doing, he or she is doing, learns how to do it better with uh, input from the tool, and uh, over time can, it could become, you know, um, uh, uh, really a force to reckon with in many ways. Mm. It's quite an important aspect of a developer's skill set. Uh, mm. skill set. 
Hmm. And I always like to ask, uh, because the audience also includes people who've been using these tools for a while, mm -hmm. uh, best practices and tips, tricks, uh, ways to get the most out of the tool. Let's say starting with a novice and then moving to someone who might be more familiar with these kinds of tools. Right. So uh, I always recommend that you know a, a user always uh, uh, keep in mind their understanding of uh, their best understanding of, of what they're doing. You know, to sort of guide them in one in one fashion or another, right? And use the data that the uh, tool is providing to corroborate that understanding or. Uh, sort of uh, use it as an indicator of well maybe I should uh, look at this a little bit deeper you know think about how I'm I'm actually uh, approaching this and so in other words leveraging not just the power of the tool but synergizing you know developing a synergy between what the tool provides and what they already know very commonsensical very direct very easy so the tool becomes not just a tool for production but part of the thought process in, in advancing the subject matter expertise becomes a, I won't say a mirror, but a way to further refine uh, what it is you're doing. Right, it's a, it's a way of quantifying, uh, you know, what you've implemented and, uh, you know, corroborating what you expected uh, or didn't expect to happen. Hmm. So, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, over time, uh, actually even for a novice, right, this, in fact, novices benefit from this tremendously uh, because, you know, they might have uh, some notions about how uh, what, what the most time-consuming parts of their code of their algorithm might be, they might not always be correct about that. Mm. At the same time, of course, if they if they measure it, they they have a, a way of either justifying their 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 notions or you know disproving them and replacing in them with other with other new understanding. So continuous knowledge here. So not just a tool for production, but of becoming more efficient and effective as a programmer and getting better at your chosen field. Right. Integrating it as part, as an integral, uh, making it an integral part of your workflow, mm. of your thought process and implementing implementation process. Mm. Great stuff. Michael Dunnell, thank you very much. Appreciate well, thank you very much.